here today with Cook County President Tony Preckwinkle. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Tia. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much for being here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> ah, you know, I am not a native born Chicagoan. I grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota, and came here when I was 18 to go to college. And I've been here, of course, ever since, at this point, almost 60 years. Um, I started out my working life as a teacher. So I was in the classroom for 10 years teaching history and then kind of knocked around a little bit. I worked for a neighborhood not-for-profit and worked for state government for a short period and worked in the city of Chicago, actually, in the Department of Economic Development before um, becoming executive director of the Chicago Jobs Council, which is a, an organization that supported those who were doing employment training work and advocated for uh, workforce issues uh, locally and nationally. And then, of course, in 1991, on my third try, I was elected alderman of the fourth ward, a position I held for almost two decades, 19 years. And then in 2010, I was elected uh, president of the Cook County Board of Commissioners, and that's a job I've held for the last 13 years. Okay. Okay. What led you to get into local politics? You know, I, I, <laughs> I like to say that I, I worked in political campaigns before, before I ever had a job. <laughs> um, when I was 16 years old, uh, my high school social studies teacher, Richard Harmon, who I still talk to occasionally, um, invited me to work in the campaign of Katie McWatt, who was an African-American woman, a community activist in St. Paul, and who was running for the city council. Um, and I was fascinated by the idea and uh, you know, worked with him. We, we made phone calls, we stuffed envelopes, we got family and friends to put out yard, yard signs for Katie McWatt. Um, unfortunately, she didn't win the election and actually she passed away a couple years ago after a long uh, life of civic engagement. Uh, but <clears throat> even though she lost, I, I, uh, I, I decided that I like campaigns. And so when I came to Chicago to go to college, I, I got involved in, in campaigns here in Chicago, mostly with the organization called Independent Voters of Illinois, which was an um, organization that is uh, a, a, a shadow of its former self, but uh, which was very active in the, I guess, 50s and 60s and 70s, uh, supporting um, good government candidates, uh, including um, most, most, dis dis <laughs> most especially Harold Washington in 1983 was part of the Harold Washington coalition that helped uh, helped elect a mayor for the first time, and of course the second time as well. So, um, so I. I, I I, I worked in political campaigns, as I said, before I ever had, <laughs> before I had a steady job. And, and all the times that I was, all the years that I was teaching and doing other things, I, I worked in campaigns as well. Okay. okay. After being the alderman of the, the fourth war, why did you want to run for Cook County president? Well, you know, <clears throat> in, in 2008, um, it was clear to me that uh, Todd Stroger, who was president of the Cook County Board of Commissioners, was not going to get reelected. Um, and so I decided that I would run. I wasn't sure whether he would run, but I knew he wasn't going to win. Um, and I, I tried, frankly, to get Danny Davis to run because I figured someone who was already a congressperson um, and represented a large swath of the, of the county uh, in, 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 in Congress would be a, a stronger candidate than somebody like me. <laughs> Um, so I talked to him a number of times. Um, you'll recall 2008 was Barack Obama's first presidential campaign, and I remember talking to him in the Democratic Convention. Um, the congressman wasn't sure how he wanted to proceed. And so finally I just said to him, look, um, if I'm going to have a, a chance uh, as a person who represents a considerably smaller part of the county than you do, um, I've got to get started right away. So I told him, I think, in November or December of 2008 that I was going to declare and run. Um, and uh, so I hired staff early in 2009. Scott Kastrup as my fundraiser, and he's still with me as my political director. And we got started in the beginning of 2009 for a primary in 2010. Um, how have you used your role as Cook County president to enrich and improve the lives of Cook County residents? 
Well, I guess the first thing I should say is that you know half of our budget, and our budget is more than eight billion dollars at this point. Half of our budget is health care, and providing good health care to all the people of of Cook County, regardless of their ability to pay, or their gender, or their sexual orientation, or their race, or their religion, um, has always been part of our mission. Uh, our hospital is more than 100 years old. Our healthcare system is more than 100 years old. Um, <clears throat> and I'm very proud of the work that we've done there, and I've worked hard to try to uh, improve the financial stability of our healthcare system, and worked with the leaders of the system to improve the quality of care. So the first thing I'd say is that we've worked hard to stabilize um, and improve access to care for the residents of Cook County. And part of that was not, not just delivering services ourself, but also creating a Medicaid expansion program, which President Obama uh, allowed us to do. Our, our Medicaid expansion program is called County Care. And so we insure people, we provide insurance company coverage for folks, um, not all of whom use our system, our two hospitals or our clinics, but who nonetheless get their coverage from us. So we both run a, a health care system, we're providers of care, we run an insurance system, a Medicaid expansion program called County Care. So that's, I guess that's the, the first thing I'd talk about, the importance of the work we do around health care. And then of course, <coughs> um, there's public safety. Uh, about 50% of our budget is health care, about 30% is public safety, so that means we run the courts and the jails. The, the sheriff has a small police force, but police services are provided mostly by our cities, towns, and villages. And we put a lot of energy in trying to Im improve the, the criminal justice system by making it more fair. You know, I, I usually say that our criminal justice systems in this country grind up black and brown people. Um, our communities are hyper-policed. Uh, you know, we're 26% of the population in the county is Latino, 24% is African American, about 8% is Asian, but three quarters of the people in the, in the jail are African Americans. Three quarters. It's ridiculous. And um, when I came, there were 11,000 people in the jail on an average daily basis. 11,000. And a lot of them were there because they were too poor to pay even nominal cash bonds. So if the judge says you got to pay $1,000 in order to walk free until you have your case adjudicated, until you go to court, until your trial, <clears throat> that would mean that you had to put down 10% in cash. And there were people in the jail who couldn't even pay $100 bonds. They or their families couldn't come up with $100. And so even if they were accused of something, a misdemeanor, a petty offense like shoplifting, they would be in jail until the disposition of their case because they couldn't pay their bond. So uh, we put a lot of energy into reducing the reliance on cash bond in the criminal justice system because it so clearly discriminates against those without resources, against those who are poor. And in this country, of course, black people are disproportionately poor. So um, we now have on a daily basis about 5,600 people in the jail. Our population's been about halved. We've substantially reduced reliance on cash bond. And over the course of time, we've advocated for um, a similar reduction in reliance on cash bond at the state level. And the state legislature passed several years ago um, the Pretrial Fairness Act. They, they passed the Safety Act, and part of it was Pretrial Fairness, PFA, uh, which was supposed to go to effect in January, but some of the Republican um, county state's attorneys across the state sued to prevent us from doing that, and so the Supreme Court is taking up the matter, and we'll see how it gets disposed of by the Supreme Court. I'm hopeful that they'll decide, as we have decided in Cook County, to reduce reliance on cash bond, but there are no guarantees. So, um, we've worked to reduce reliance on cash bond. We've worked with all of the stakeholders, the sheriff, the state's attorney, the chief judge, the public defender, and the clerk of the court, um, to speed up the disposition of cases. Um, We've, we've tried in a number of different ways to reduce the number of people in jail, the number of people who come in contact with the criminal justice system, a lot of um, diversion programs that keep people from either going to jail in the per first place or if they are convicted of a crime <clears throat> of going to prison, but there are other alternatives for them. Um, there are drug courts, there are veterans courts, and so on uh, to deal with specific 
parts of the population that might come in contact with the criminal justice system. But criminal justice reform has been a priority for me just as improving the um, access to health care for people in Cook County. Um, we've also tried uh, more recently to do uh, some innovative stuff with the federal resources that have come to us through the uh, um, American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA, um, two of which we've been talking a lot about lately, one of which is a guaranteed income pilot. Uh, <coughs> and we have 3,250, I think, uh, individuals who are in the program. They get $500 a month for two years uh, without strings attached. And we are uh, tracking their uh, outcomes uh, with academic researchers so we can compare them to a, a, a population that didn't get this assistance and support and see how the, how the, the two years sort of varied between those two groups in terms, as I said, of outcomes. So we've, we've done that guaranteed income work. We started that at the, the end of last year, 2022, and it'll go for two years. And we also just recently um, um, shared with the public our work around medical debt. We, we put 12 million aside. By the way, the guaranteed income pilot, I think is 42 million, which is the largest guaranteed income pilot program in the country. Um, we were the first out of the gate, and we're still, I think, the largest medical debt program. We're working with an organization called RIP Medical Debt um, to eliminate people's medical debt. We work with physician groups and hospital groups, and uh, we just announced, I think, that we'd spent $800,000 to eliminate um, $80 million, $80 million of medical debt for more than 70,000 families in Cook County. And no application required. We just work with physician groups and hospitals um, in a partnership. And instead of selling their debt to collection agencies, you know, when you don't pay your debts, whoever you owe the money to may hound you for a while, then they turn it over to a specialist, right? A collection agency. Okay. And for us, what we, what we do with RIP medical debt is intervene in that process. And so if the physician group or the hospital Instead of selling the debt to a collection agency, they sell it to RIP Medical Debt, and RIP Medical Debt just wipes it out for the, for the, for the patient, for the individuals and their families. And so they get a letter from, from RIP Medical Debt and from the county saying your, your medical debt has been um, erased and um, we wish you well. And we clean up their credit scores. And for many families, um, you know, medical debt negatively impacts their credit score and therefore their ability to get mortgages, to buy cars, you know, whatever. Um, and bankruptcy, the, the, the leading cause of bankruptcy in this country is inability to pay your medical bills. So medical debt has all kinds of um, um, consequences that might not occur to you right off the bat. Um, people are disinclined to pursue more medical care if they've got medical debt. So not just routine uh, exams and screenings, but even treatment for serious illnesses. So if we wipe out the medical debt, people are more likely to get the medical care they need, to pursue additional care as they need it, and um, to be in better financial shape, have higher credit scores. So it's a, it's a boon to those who, um, who are blessed in this way, and we're working with RIP to help as many folks as we can. And in our first round, as I said, we helped more than 70,000. We've got $12 million to spend, and we've spent a little less than a million. Okay, great, great. Um, during your time as Cook County President, what is the one thing you are most proud of? Uh, well, that, <laughs> that's hard. Um, you know, I, I guess I would say, I've talked a lot about the sort of um, service areas, right? Health and hospital system, criminal justice reform, and then some of these initiatives with the American Rescue Plan Act. But really what I'm proudest of is we've, we've got a great team in the county. We've been able to convince a lot of, a lot of very talented people uh, to come and work with us. And, and that's really the way in which you accomplish anything in government. Um, you know, you may be the elected official, but uh, the work gets done by lots of folks who are never elected to office and who uh, often work for less than they would get in the private sector. Uh, but, but they have tremendous opportunities to make a difference in people's lives, and that makes those jobs attractive to folks. 
why is it important for Cook County to have equity plans for disinvested communities? You know, I'm the leader of, of county government, the second largest county in the country after Los Angeles. And I think it's really important for government leaders to acknowledge the ways, the multiple ways in which government has been not just a bystander, but an active participant in the damage that's been done to communities of color in this country. I, I talked a little bit about the criminal justice system and the ways in which um, black and brown communities are hyper-policed. Um, the fact that, you know, at every juncture that you can think of, black folks in particular, you know, with, when a policeman, police officer, because it could be a man or a woman, stops you on the street, you know, white folks are more likely than black folks to get a warning and be sent on their way. Black folks are more likely to get that ticket or be hauled in, right? And in the station, particularly for young people, there are more station adjustments for white kids who come into the criminal justice system, that is, they're sent home with their parents, than black and brown kids who get instead put into the juvenile justice system. And the outcomes for, for, for young people or for adults as well, you know, if you look at racial breakdowns, people have you know, similar backgrounds, similar criminal histories or lack thereof, it's still true that the black and brown folks get different and more punitive sentences than white people. Now, the, the racism in this country has profound impact in every aspect of our lives, and surely criminal justice is one of those ways. So, and the criminal justice system is a government system, right? Um, and if you think about it, I mean, Kim Fox, God bless her, uh, when she came in as state's attorney, said, I mean, we're basically, we're going to do business differently. Um, Chicago and Cook County were the wrongful conviction capital of the country. And she's done everything she can to try to address um, the harm done by uh, Burge and his allies on the south side. And uh, I think his... Rivera or Rivero up on the northwest side, um, you know, who basically tortured people, beat people, uh, planted evidence on people uh, to put them in jail. Um, and, you know, she's trying to um, make amends for those terrible wrongs by um, bringing into people into court, sometimes people who've been had long prison sentences. Um, and, and vacating their convictions. I mean, and again, this is government doing this <laughs> to our own citizens, right? Um, and she, she, of course, has worked on expungement of drug convictions. And, you know, if you look at use of illicit drugs in this country, about 8% of every group used illicit drugs. But people in our prison for drug use are black, poor black and brown people. It's rich people, it's not rich white people who are in jails for drug use, right? It's poor black and brown people. So, as I said, those of us who are in government, I think are incumbent, it's incumbent upon us to acknowledge the ways in which government has contributed to the damage done to black and brown communities and to do everything we can to rectify it. So, um, I talked about county commitment to health care. Clearly, healthcare ought to be universal, a universal right in this country. Um, it's not. But those of us who are responsible for healthcare have to try to do everything we can to ensure that those people who need help get it, whether or not they're insured. So we're trying to do that with our healthcare system. Those who come in contact with the criminal justice system, we have to acknowledge the racism that uh, impacts defendants at every step in the criminal justice process and do what we can to try to mitigate the terrible consequences of that racism. Um, the, 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 the initiative I talked about earlier, um, guaranteed income, it, it's a way and a way of uh, addressing the inequality of opportunity in this country. You know, I, I've been really blessed uh, in lots of ways. Uh, both my parents were college graduates in a time when very few people in this country let alone very few black people, um, had college educations. And, and that, in a way, has made all the difference in my life. There was an ex expectation that all four of us would go to college, all four of us are college graduates. You know, and I'm in my 70s, so again, this is college-educated black folks. 
are not the majority now. They surely weren't the majority when I was growing up or when my parents were growing up. Um, but my parents had opportunities, and this is important, because of government programs in the Depression. When, when FDR was, was president of the United States, there were all kinds of ways in which the government stepped up to help not just young people, but adults as well, um, meet the challenges of the Depression. So there are examples of ways in which government can be tremendously helpful and supportive to its residents, and there are examples that I've given them of ways in which government can, as I said, do harm. Um, so my goal is, as uh, Chief Executive of the County is to use the levers at my disposal in every way I can to support our residents who are in need. Um, and those residents in need in our county are disproportionately people of color. Um, how would you describe your term as Cook County President and how has your role changed throughout the years? Well, for the first, so this is my beginning of my fourth term. In my first term, the first four years, we spent most of our time trying to figure out how we were going to get the finances in order. Um, when I came in office, we had a budget gap to close, to have a balanced budget of almost half a billion dollars. It was $487 million. And I had to go to every separately elected official, of whom there are 11 in Cook County, and say, um, you're going to have to cut your budget because there's, there's no money. There was a lot of kicking and screaming, but that. <laughs> uh, and unfortunately, we had to lay off people because I mean, most of your expenses are always personnel. Um, so we had several difficult, very difficult years at the beginning of my tenure. And the focus had to be, as I said, almost entirely on the finances because the finances of the county were such a mess. At the beginning of my second term in 2015, um, we passed a sales tax increase of a penny to help us meet our pension obligations. Um, you know, when people work for government, uh, they historically have accepted more modest salaries than they could get elsewhere in return for good benefits, one of which good health care benefits and, and a pension plan. Um, but we were not funding our, our pension plan at the level that would make it sustainable over the long term. So <clears throat> what we did was raise the sales tax and say to the public, we're going to meet our pension obligations um, and we're going to use the money for infrastructure. So um, those are the two big buckets that we've um, used to meet our obligations uh, or we've used the resources for um, since the beginning of 2016. So at that point, this is like seven years ago. Um, we put in more than a billion dollars above the statutory requirements. We have a statutory, that means by law, contribution we have to make for our pension funds. But that does not meet the requirements for making the pension fund fully funded. So we contribute more money, the people who are the financial wizards, the, act, the actuaries, what they tell us to contribute, which is more than the law says we have to contribute. And we've contributed more than a billion above and beyond our legal obligation in the last seven years. And our pension fund, the last time I checked, was about 67% funded. We're trying to get it up to 80%, which is by most um, experts, um, they consider that fully funded, 80%. So, um, and we're on a plan, I think, that get there in 2040, if I remember correctly. So, um, in any case, we're on a ramp to, to have our pension fully funded. You know, this is, we're, the last time I heard the governor speak, the state pensions were funded at 44%. So we're, <laughs> we're, we're, the, the state and the city are not in a good place in terms of pension funding, but we raised the sales tax so we could put ourselves on a good financial footing. And by the way, when, when, you, when you have these outstanding pension obligations, um, the, the firms that rate your um, financial viability whack you, right? because you've got this outstanding liability that you're not addressing. So it improved our credit rating for the county. And so when we go into the market to borrow money, uh, it costs us less. Just as you as a family, if you have a good credit score, it doesn't, you don't have to pay such high interest rates when you want to borrow things. So borrow money. So um, we were able, because we made some difficult decisions, to stabilize the finances initially and then to address the outstanding challenges 
which was our pension obligations. Um, and after that, we, we had um, the bandwidth to, to do things like um, address the, the challenges in our criminal justice system, um, which is, as I said, along with healthcare, the primary um, uh, obligation of the county, and it's also where I, most of my time goes. Where can people go to access Cook County government resources? Well, we have a website, which is cookcountyil.gov. So Cook County, www.cookcountyil.gov. Um, and you can find information about county services and activities there. Um, so I would encourage you to do that. Um, before we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like our audience to know? You know, this is a difficult moment for the city and the county. Uh, I just came from an event for Mayor-elect Brandon Johnson. And the city has two big challenges, and I hope uh, that we can work together. That is, city and county can work together to address them. One, of course, is the violence. and. Um, I think people all across the city are concerned about violence. All of our neighborhoods. You know, we had a, an exemplary young woman, a police officer, who was just recently what, shot and killed in front of her own house. Um, it's heartbreaking. Not, 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 not just because she was a police officer and charged with protecting all the rest of us, she was a young woman in, in the prime of her life, and uh, and she's no longer with us. And it's not just that she's lost her life and her family's been impacted. The young people who've been addressed, who are, are being arrested and, and who, you know, the courts will determine their guilt or innocence. Um, you know, but if they're found guilty, their lives are destroyed too. They're gonna spend 30, 40 years in prison. Um, this is just a tragedy all the way around, and it's tragedy that it plays out in our city every day. Um, so the violence is really troubling and um, we have dedicated in the county uh, 75 million? We're 100 now. Okay, thank you, Nick. Closer to 100 now um, million dollars for violence prevention, anti-recidivism, that is keeping people who were in jail or prison from going back programs that serve returning residents so that they hopefully can turn their lives around, and restorative justice work. So in those three areas, uh, we've um, engaged community-based partners um, to help us address those challenges, and we've spent $100 million. Uh, we've allocated $100 million to try to do that. Um, and this is our own money, that is county resources plus the federal resources from the American Rescue Plan Act. So. We're trying to address that challenge and the city and the county need to work together uh, to be sure that we make the best of our best use of our resources. The second big challenge is the asylum seekers. Um, you know, it's very discouraging to me that um, so many folks are hostile uh, to people who want to come to our country for economic opportunity or religious freedom or to escape political persecution. Um, especially for us as black people, having uh, seen so much, so many trials in this country, um, I, I would hope that we would be empathetic to people who have faced tremendous challenges in their own lives uh, and who look to this country as a place, a land of opportunity. Uh, so we've got to figure out what to do. 8,000 people have come to uh, Chicago, uh, many of them on buses from Texas since August. And uh, as you've probably seen or read about, you know, their families are living in police stations because we don't have places to house them. And we've got to figure out how we can, as a city and a county, uh, meet the needs of these newcomers. As many of our family members were newcomers to the city in previous generations. Um, and be good neighbors and decent human beings in the way we address the challenges they face and we face. So those are the two big things that I see ahead of us and that I hope to work with Mayor-elect Johnson on.
Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Remember to make plans to join us again next week for Conversations with the Citizens.